Okay, I think it's time to start. Say so, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the session on are cybersecurity and piracy reconcilable? I'm uh, Nicolas Segurias, and I'm law professor at the University of Sheffield. Uh, security and pi uh, privacy are two values that define our cyber experience, but they raise questions about their limits, about adjudication and regulation. The panelists will deal with these issues and many more. Each panelist has 15 minutes to present, which will give us around 30 minutes for discussion. So I will start with the introducing the first speaker. Uh, the first speaker is Theodor Christakis. Uh, Theodor is professor of international law at the University of Grenoble, and he is also a member of the Institut Universitaire de France. The title of his presentation is The Internet of Things, Challenges for Cybersecurity, Privacy, and the Legal Order. Theodor. Bonjour à tous. Uh, I will talk to you uh, about a topic which is extremely important, but uh, not at all studied for the time being in international law. Uh, I will talk to you about the Internet of Things and uh, the challenges and risks for the legal order. Uh, without wasting any time, I will present you my outline. I will first explain to you what is the IoT, Internet of Things, and why it is changing rapidly the world. I will then present you the risks and challenges, and then the international law responses. The Internet of Things uh, refers to the ability of everyday objects to connect to the Internet and to send and receive data. And uh, you all know the networks connecting people. The IoT is a network that connects things, all kinds of things. Uh, technically speaking, IoT is an infrastructure in which billions of uh, sensors embedded in common everyday devices are designed to record, process, store, and transfer data and interact with other devices or systems using network capabilities. And the result is that billions of things can be connected to each other via the IoT. So many things that some do not speak about the Internet of Things, but speak instead about the Internet of Everything. What is the philosophy of IoT? As a matter of fact, once all these devices uh, come together, they create a coherent system that can act with its own type of intelligence. And the whole philosophy is that our life could only get better if computers knew everything there is to know about the things around us and about us using data that they gather automatically without any help. This will enable to track, to uh, count, to assess everything and to generate automatically solutions. And all this will result to enormous benefits for consumers and for society, and also to enormous economic benefits, because this creates countless business opportunities. This is why the IoT is a top priority in the industrial agendas of all nations, including the EU, uh, concerning the digital single market. And there are estimations about uh, the uh, number of things that will be connected uh, by 2020, which vary from 26 billion things connected to an astonishing 212 billion devices. And uh, the same estimations concerning the uh, revenue estimated for loads of companies vary from a modest 1.9 to uh, almost $9 trillion. Dollars. Absolutely amazing from all points of view, the IoT, uh, the IoT is changing our world. Let me give you some examples in order to understand better. 
You all know the wearables and the uh, quantified self uh, devices, everyday objects, Google Glasses, Apple Watch 2 that just came out, and all these uh, objects that include sensors, connected sensors to the internet, and which very often also uh, permit to individuals to record information about their sport, their lifestyle, uh, their habits, uh, etc. For example, in the field, uh, a field where the IoT is extremely promising is the medical health field, uh, healthcare, uh, because we have all type of devices giving all type of information to doctors remotely, generating automatically solutions, letting you know if your grandmother uh, fell in her house or not, or if there is a problem. And this uh, is a promise that this will completely revolutionize medical research and healthcare. Uh, you all know also, you have heard about the IoT in the domotics uh, uh, session with all type of things in our homes, which include the sensors and which can uh, 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 generate solutions and uh, uh, actions, uh, like, for example, your uh, uh, um, uh, freezer who tells you to buy milk or ice cream, because there is not any more. Uh, you have all heard of uh, the IoT in uh, smart or self-driving cars with the promise that this will uh, render uh, driving much safer. There will be no need for policemen to stop you anymore because all things will be done regularly. Uh, uh, among the latest IoT who came out, for example, you have the self-propelled uh, baby stroller uh, hands-free, which from now and on you can do your jogging because there are automatic sensors in your baby's uh, stroller which permit you uh, to keep the distance safely without any problem, or even better, the smart diapers for your baby, which not only tell you when to change the baby, but which give you all kinds of information about uh, uh, the health of your baby automatically. Now, uh, this is very good, but this has uh, very, a lot of risks and challenges, enormous risks uh, for cybersecurity and privacy, which have become of one of the major concerns for the development of IoT. And we have a lot of risks, but especially two kinds of risks. And first, risk for cyber criminality, cyber terrorism, and security risks. Some of the risks, of course, uh, could sound comical if uh, the stove does not uh, speak to the refrigerator anymore, it's not a problem, or if a hacker, a bad guy, hacks your smart toilet and makes it flash repeatedly, this will not be a problem for international law, of course. But other scenarios are uh, much more scary, and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, we can easily imagine an attacker who hacks uh, the internal computer network of a car in order to use it for terrorist purposes, and uh, probably this will mean the end of the kamikaze era for terrorist groups. Uh, instead of using kamikaze, they will need IT experts instead. Uh, recently, the FBI published an important announcement uh, about pre uh, precisely the major risks of, for cyber criminality, uh, the risk of being used uh, for, by malicious cyber criminals for several reasons. And uh, there are a lot of uh, questions concerning medical devices recently. For example, a woman uh, um, woke up from uh, surgery with a new uh, uh, pacemaker, I'm sorry, to correct a heart condition. And uh, she suddenly realized that this life-saving device uh, in her chest exposed her to completely different kind of threats. More precisely, all new pacemakers are uh, wirelessly uh, have wirelessly connected capabilities, and this the doctors did not tell her when they put the pacemaker, uh, so uh, she was very much afraid, being an IT expert, that somebody might hack uh, the pacemaker, uh, creating, uh, and this has been done uh, regularly these last years, uh, uh, IT experts hacking, uh, 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 as a matter of fact, uh, pacemakers or uh, uh, belt-mounted insulin pumps uh, and other things. Another major category of risks, the second major category of risk, is for, uh, as a matter of fact, privacy. Um, uh, you know uh, that we're living the era of uh, commodification of data, and uh, that our data are extremely valuable to all kinds of companies, and uh, uh, can give all kinds of information for us, uh, as a matter of fact, and this creates a lot, a lot of uh, problems, um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I could give you the example 
of uh, uh, health devices. We have all these devices, Apple Watch, uh, the uh, fitness uh, uh, wristbands and monitors who give all this information. And uh, as a matter of fact, what uh, uh, we don't know is that all this information is not read only by us, but is read by many other people. You remember the song, Every Breath You Take, I'll Be Watching You. I will not be the only one watching you, as a matter of fact, because uh, uh, a recent study by uh, the FTC uh, in uh, the United States showed that 12 mobile health applications and devices transmitted information to 76 different third parties, and some of the data could be linked back to users. Uh, so uh, you understand that there is a major problem, and another major problem is, is this protected medical data? If I go to the doctor and he takes my blood pressure, for example, this is protected medical data, but if I have, I have my Apple Watch, which does this, and I generate this data, can, could this con con be considered as protected medical uh, data? Uh, and uh, this is a very uh, big problem, of course, and uh, the other thing that we must understand is that uh, health data are extremely vulnerable. If somebody has access to your health data, you cannot change them like a stolen credit card. Uh, this will create a very big damage. And tomorrow we'll have advertising when you go to the supermarket asking you how are your hemorrhoids and proposing you solutions and uh, drugs for this. I think that it's also interesting to see the biggest picture, uh, which is uh, we could ask ourselves, uh, where do we go? Could the data and IoT destroy human freedom uh, entirely? There are some very good experts. As a matter of fact, I highly recommend you the latest book by Yuval Harari, who says exactly this, that uh, data will destroy human freedom. Why? Because as the global data processing system becomes all the more powerful, uh, connected to the system becomes the source of all meaning. The new motto, you all know it. If you experience something, just record it. If you record something, upload it. If you upload something, share it. What does it, what's the meaning of feeling something if you don't not upload it uh, on uh, the internet? And uh, uh, well, uh, all this gives a lot of big data, and uh, the big data know us better than we know ourselves. And we could ask uh, ourselves, uh, what are we going to be in this uh, uh, future world of data processing? As a matter of fact, uh, are we going to be just information points and lose entirely our freedom? The answer to this for us lawyers is that we need to become legal innovators, entirely rethink uh, the system, rethink human rights, and go, think about where we're heading. Uh, uh, probably we can find better solutions than call Bruce Willis, but there are a lot of obstacles to legal innovation. I cannot present them here because I don't have enough time, but uh, uh, consumer indifference or fatalism, 71% of people think that privacy is over uh, and this is the price to pay in order to use the internet. Well, uh, what are the responses? And Zuckerberg said this, he said, you already have zero privacy, get over it. As a matter of fact, what are the responses of international law to all these things? There is absolutely no doubt that we desperately need international law. It's only international law that can really deal effectively with all these problems because of the globalized nature of data flows. Every time you use a fitness device, etc., your data are stored in Norway or in Arctic, uh, transferred in the United States. It's absolutely necessary to have international law. And this creates three major questions. One, strategies. Two, actors. Three, substantial principles. Let's start with the strategies. There are some major questions. Should we opt for, for self-regulation or we need state regulation? Here, of course, the industry asks for self-regulation, but it is very clear that this cannot be enough in this field. We desperately need state regulation. If we need state regulation, are we going to opt for soft law, code, codes of contact, best practices, etc., or we need hard law? No uh, doubt about the fact that soft law is useful, is useful but we really need hard law uh, in this field. And then third question, do we need a specific IoT regulation, 
Or is it better to think about a technologically natural rules which could be applied to all technologies, including the future ones, and not just IoT, but IoT will be covered. Probably this is the best solution, and this is, was the solution, as you will see immediately, chosen, for example, by the EU very, uh, lately uh, concerning uh, data protection. And finally, uh, if we need uh, uh, technologically natural rules, are we going to talk for specific data protection or general privacy protection provisions such as Article 8 of the European Convention or Article 17 of the ICCPR are enough? The answer is clear. We need specific data protection. So which are the actors in this field? If we start at the universal level, we see that there is absolutely nothing concerning IoT as a matter of fact, and even concerning data protection rules, we are far away from something effective. Of course, we have Article 17 of the ICCPR, for example, and there is now discussion, uh, a lot of discussion for an additional protocol precisely of Article 17 in order uh, to deal with uh, data protection, but uh, we are far away from this, and if you read the, the first report of the special rapporteur, Kanatazzi, uh, when he deals with major issues, he does not even mention IoT, and he has so many issues to deal with, uh, and we understand that we are far away from something effective at the universal level. At the regional level, we have plenty of initiatives. I don't have the time to discuss them here, but we have uh, at the OECD, at the APEC, uh, ECOWAS. Let me just mention also the Council of Europe. It's interesting because the Council of Europe started all this process in 1981 with, with Convention 108. They tried desperately these last years to modernize this convention and also to open it to accession by uh, foreign states. But as a matter of fact, what is clear is that here the legal innovator, the real leader here by far is the EU, and especially the EU did something really great last May. It adopted the uh, general data protection regulation and also uh, the data protection uh, directi uh, directive, and uh, this will completely change the landscape of data protection. So what kind of principles? This will be the last part of my expose. Uh, we can think about, I, can, I will use here precisely the general data protection regulation uh, in order to explain to you which will be the building blocks of protecting privacy tomorrow. All these things are including in this uh, uh, regulation, which will become universal law in one way or another, and I could explain during the debates why and how. Uh, first, uh, one remark about territoriality. Very easy uh, response by the General Data Protection Regulation. One, one single law for EU, all EU states, no directive anymore, we go through a regulation. And two, this regulation applies every time somebody is using data from somebody based in Europe which means that we have, don't have to worry anymore where is the cloud computing system, uh, etc. Uh, we always apply this regulation in order to protect people based in Europe. Uh, I have, uh, as a matter of fact, I think that we can regroup all the things in this directive and in the future law of data protection in relation with IoT uh, in three big principles. The first is what I call the principle of self-determination of the data subject with a series of rights, because the whole idea of this general protection regulation is to put people in control of their data. They must have effective control of their data, starting with consent. Uh, you need a clear affirmative consent every time that it is required, and this consent must meet from now on, on very high standards right of access, easy access to personal data, right to rectification, the right to erasure, the famous right to be uh, forgotten, but also right to be informed or in case of security breach in 72 hours at latest, and not only you, but also you have to inform the data protection uh, um, body, and also the right to data portability. Every time you change a service or provi provider, you can transfer easily your data from one service provider to the other. The second big principle is what I call the responsibility to protect uh, with a series of additional obligations for IoT developers, but also data controllers and processors. As a matter of fact, um, this is the whole idea that they must go further in order to protect your data. First of all, the principle of fairness, uh, which means that personal data should never be collected and processed without the individual being actually aware of it. Second, enhancing transparency 
Individuals need better information on data protection policies and what happens to their data. Three, obligation to, uh, prov to uh, make privacy impact assessments every time that there are risks for privacy. Uh, four, very important, cybersecurity and privacy by design, which means that data protection safeguards should be built into products and devices, and uh, the uh, regulation pushes for anonymization, pseudonymization, and encryption. And also privacy by default, which means every time you buy a new product, it must already have, uh, have uh, include the uh, friendly, privacy-friendly settings, um, uh, and you don't have to uh, act in order to enhance privacy. And also the purpose limitation and data minimization principle, data can be collected only for specified and legitimate purposes. Any further, further processing would be incompatible with these original uh, purposes and illegal. And also that data that is unnecessary for that purpose should not be collected and stored, uh, stored just in case. It might be useful tomorrow. It's a major issue for IoT but for, because, for example, here in the United States and in many other um, issues, the United States has an entirely different approach saying that we need all kind of data in order to be able to adopt good solutions for society uh, tomorrow. Uh, restrictions of international transfers of personal uh, data, uh, uh, both we find here the uh, adequacy decision but also the idea that uh, uh, we can put in place appropriate safeguards in order uh, to be able to transfer data at the international level. And finally, a lot of procedural and control requirements, mandatory data protection officers in all companies and public authorities, um, cooperation with uh, data protection bodies, creation of an EU data protection body, and all these things. Finally, uh, account liability, uh, uh, big sanctions, uh, the possibility for data protection bodies to adopt fines uh, which are amazing, which uh, go, uh, as a matter of fact, up to 20 million euro or 4% uh, of annual turnover of companies, whichever is higher, and a compensation liability for victims. Uh, the only thing is that, uh, as a matter of fact, a recent survey showed that 50% of global IT companies think that they will never be able uh, to uh, uh, comply with all these requirements. So it will be very interesting and funny to see what will happen with these fines. Conclusion, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I will not speak about this. Directly I go to the conclusion. If my slide wants to go to the conclusion, is it possible to put it back, please? Thank you. Here is the conclusion. I was recently very much surprised to see that the first book entitled The End of Privacy was published, do you know when? In 1969, as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, what is interesting is that to see that every time the apocalyptic predictions about the, end, the death of privacy were followed by a growing body of uh, international uh, legal, uh, domestic and international regulations, which rendered these predictions inaccurate. And uh, uh, over the time this last year, privacy gained a kind of zombie status, uh, um, repeatedly killed, but just uh, rising once again in order to be killed again. Well, the latest news from international law and EU law especially is that probably reports on the death of privacy in the internet era are highly exaggerated. And I think that the conclusion must be that the spectacular developments of IoT should take place respecting data security and data protection rules, whatever the cost. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. Now, the next speaker is Dr. Mando Rachovica. Uh, Mando is a lecturer at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And she's going to speak on humanizing the net, how to conceptualize the relationship between cybersecurity and privacy. Mando. No, this is not the one.
technical glitch, so it's cybersecurity issue. <laughs> no? no, it's the other one. Cubo hacked you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So, good morning, good afternoon. Depends what time you woke up. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm afraid my PowerPoint cannot beat uh, Theodore's cartoons, but I'll do my best. Today, I would like to share a few thoughts on how we should articulate the relationship between cybersecurity and privacy, and why this is fundamentally important to how we make and apply the law. Now, the most popular way to frame this relationship is to ask how to reconcile cybersecurity and privacy, which is also the title of this Agora. This question brings in a frame of reference according to which cybersecurity and privacy are competing interests and they are in conflict or at least in tension. I argue today that this is not the right question to ask and that framing it as such falls short of grasping the complexity of the interrelation between cybersecurity and privacy. More specifically, I argue that cybersecurity and privacy are mutually supportive goals. In fact, cybersecurity and privacy and freedom of expression are mutually supportive goals and they are in a strictly interdependent relationship in the online environment. Therefore, international law should somehow enrich its vocabulary and analytical tools in order to think of cybersecurity and privacy or privacy as a precondition to cybersecurity. This relationship can be depicted in many ways. For example, sorry about that. So, for example, yes, like this, or like this. Now, on this basis, I will discuss a human rights approach to cybersecurity in cyberspace by bringing together three different aspects and different approaches, the international policy approach, the technical approach, and the human rights law approach. I will also attempt very briefly to uh, give some examples of how one can apply this human rights approach to legal reasoning. Starting with the role of privacy, <laughs> sorry, but it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Starting with the role of privacy as an international legal issue in interstate discussions with regard to cybersecurity. Cybersecurity became officially an international issue when in 1998 Russia introduced a draft resolution in the first committee of the General Assembly regarding information security. Despite the fact that two different groups of governmental experts have been discussing cybersecurity in the context of information security and international security, it is clear that there is little, if any, consensus on the development of international principles of responsible behavior in cyberspace. The disagreements among states are an, an inevitable consequence of an altogether different starting point regarding the concept of cybersecurity and free flow of information. On the one hand, Russia, China, and a growing alliance of states promote a securitization narrative of cybersecurity and cyberspace. These states insist on the term information security. This approach postulates that information itself is a threat against which protection is needed, and the regulation of content online is subject to the domain reserve of states, otherwise known as cyber sovereignty. Now, on the other hand, many other states, including, of course, the US and the, the so-called Western Bloc, do not recognize the validity of the term information security in this context, and they opt out for the term cybersecurity. Cybersecurity needs to be technically neutral, and not regulate information or content. 
Security measures should aim only at preserving the key technical internet properties and characteristics, including open and global accessibility, integrity, resilience, and decentralized innovative technical evolution. Human rights now, within this context, were understood as being completely irrelevant. It was only privacy that featured a couple of times in Russia's submissions as a pretext to regulate, obviously, content. This changed, however, when the US, with its own alliance of states, decided that the securitization narrative of cyberspace and cybersecurity, let's try it, So this changed when the U.S. decided that the securitization, the securitization narrative of cybersecurity and cyberspace needed somehow to be counteracted. They brought the issue of human rights online with, before the Human Rights Council in an effort to frame cybersecurity in a different forum and within the context of the international human rights law paradigm. The Human Rights Council affirmed for the first time in 2012 that the same rights that people have online must also be protected online. In its 2016 resolution, the Human Rights Council went so far as to underline the importance of applying a human rights approach to cyberspace. In this way, the debate now concerns not only the free flow of information, but also the international human right to freedom of expression. One need to be very cautious, though, with a human rights approach, since it is only the right to freedom of expression which is employed in a rather instrumental fashion to support the free flow of information narrative. There is no mention in the text of the human rights uh, council resolutions to other human rights uh, whatsoever. Nonetheless, since 2014, the role of privacy within the cybersecurity discussion has further evolved. In the aftermath of the Snowden revelations on mass surveillance, a shift took place regarding the role of privacy within the human rights approach to cyberspace. In 2014, Germany raised serious concerns in the first committee of the General Assembly regarding unlawful and arbitrary surveillance. Germany specifically underlined that security, freedom, and privacy online are complementary concepts. The same year, Germany and Brazil lobbied in the third committee of the General Assembly for a resolution specifically on privacy online. The General Assembly, for the first time, noted the capacity of states and non-state actors to undertake surveillance, inter interception, and data collection, which may violate or abuse the right to privacy, as set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the ICPR. The consensus achieved in the right to privacy in the Digital Age Resolution addresses privacy as an international legal concern on an equal footing to freedom of expression. This consensus was subsequently reaffirmed in the 2015 General Assembly Resolution, and in the meantime, the 2015 Human Rights Council Resolution incorporates and catches up with this change in state practice. The Human Rights Council called states to address security concerns online in accordance with their international human rights law obligations to ensure protection of freedom of expression and privacy. Crucially, the protection of human rights is now directly linked with the importance of building confidence and trust in the internet. This is an important point underlying that both privacy and freedom of expression are in a symbiotic and interdependent relationship to cybersecurity. Let me now very briefly discuss the technical understanding of the role of privacy within the context of cybersecurity. There is no better place to turn to but the work of the IETF. IETF stands for Internet Engineering Task Force. The IETF is an informal community of computer scientists, geeks, and they take very uh, great pride in calling themselves geeks, who regulate and manage the internet on a daily basis by developing technical standards known as internet standards. The IETF's mission is to make the internet work better and protect the free flow of information. Now, in the aftermath, again, of the Snowden revelations, the IETF was alarmed. It found that pervasive monitoring is an attack on the privacy of internet users and constitutes a breakdown in trust. 
This is so because privacy is a basic tenant for the well-functioning of cyberspace. Privacy is a precondition for internet users to trust the network. In light of the decentralized nature, compare centralized and decentralized. So in light of the decentralized nature of cyberspace, uh, if users don't trust the network, there is no network to begin with, because in a decentralized uh, network, all users have equal contribution. For this reason, the IETF made itself a paradigm shift in its own standardization work in order to retain the security, resilience, and integrity of communications. Privacy now, in its work, is a design requirement when creating internet standards, and more security mechanisms, including encryption, are put in place to better support privacy in the infrastructure of the internet. Now, it should be underlined that the IETF does not regard privacy as a human rights issue, but rather as a technical matter related to the functioning of the network. In a nutshell, the insights that we can get from this perspective, the technical perspective, are the following. First, the effective protection of privacy is a necessary condition for internet users to maintain trust to the internet. Second, the resilience, integrity, and security of communications are properties and values that ought to be protected in themselves. Third, privacy and security online complement one another. Now, according to what, have been, to what has been discussed thus far, the human rights angle, or if you wish, the human rights approach to cyberspace and cybersecurity, contributes to framing the debate among states, guiding and shaping national and international policy and law, uh, comprehending, of course, the function of privacy with regard to security online and trust and confidence to the network. These are all equally valuable contributions in themselves, but there is an urgent need to further explore how the international policy and technical understandings of privacy inform the interpretation and application of human rights online. The Human Rights Council and the General Assembly may have proclaimed that human rights apply offline and online, but what does this really mean? Many courts, including the Court of Justice of the European Union and the European Court of Human Rights, stress that the specific features of the internet need to be taken into consideration, but this does not necessarily mean that these courts infer and apply in practice what they proclaim that they should do. In fact, my own understanding uh, of the case of the Court of Justice of the European Union and the European Court of Human Rights is that it is rather disappointing and that there is great room for improvement. The analysis in, in the paper examines in, in, in detail how the technical features of the network could be translated into legal reasoning, but for the purpose of the presentation, I will just give some highlights and quick examples. First, preserving the integrity and interoperability of the network must be an autonomous consideration in legal reasoning. So, in this way, national and international courts, and perhaps other bodies too, should duly appreciate the impact of a given measure, both from a human rights law point of view and from the perspective of the functioning of the internet. So they need somehow to make uh, a brief technical analysis. In other words, a, a judge should ask, does a given measure or my own judgment have a negative impact on the general operation and the security of the internet? Such a technical impact, please bear in mind, could in turn adversely affect other human rights and other interests. Second, always keep in mind that freedom of expression, the right to privacy, and security online are interconnected. This should run through all stages of legal reasoning, including the assessment of interference or the proportionality test. The importance of construing the interlinkage between privacy and freedom of expression is exemplified in the Google Spain case, the well-known judgment that established the right to be forgotten. In its judgment, the Court of Justice of the EU relied heavily upon the fact that the effect of the interference with privacy and data protection is heightened on account of the role of the internet search engines. While this is true, the court, however, did not acknowledge that at the same time, 
the internet provides an unprecedented potential for the effective exercise and fulfillment of the right to freedom of expression and other rights. The court also dismissed the argument that the potential seriousness of the interference can be somehow counterbalanced by the economic interest of a search engine. Yet again, the court's analysis falls short of appreciating that a service provider and a search engine is not only associated with economic interests, that's true, but also enables the right to freedom of expression and the right to access information. As a consequence, the, the court framed the case before it as an instance of a tension between data protection, uh, which is a fundamental right, and the economic interest of a search engine, whereas there was also a tension between two fundamental rights in EU law, data protection and freedom of expression. Uh, two minutes? Okay. Even though I personally disagree with the outcome in the Google Spain case, my main objection concerns the poor reasoning of the court. On the other side of the spectrum, the El, El Tiempo judgment delivered by the Constitutional Court of Colombia provides an exemplary reasoning on how to read the privacy, the right to privacy and freedom of expression in a balanced way. The case concerned a, a different topic. It concerned intermediary li um, liability. But what is of interest here is the court's reasoning. So first, the court analyzed in great length the special features of the internet, including the meaning of the decentralized nature of the network and how the principle of neutrality and the exceptions attached to it serve the well-functioning of the internet. Now, building upon these unique features, the Constitutional Court cautiously noted that imposing intermediary liability has the potential to turn a search engine into a sensor of content posted by users. This, and this is the interesting part, according to the court, may, and this is almost quoting, may affect the architecture of the internet by way of ignoring their governing principles of access equal uh, non-discrimination and pluralism. Consequently, imposing intermediary liability not only has a mere technical influence on the operation of the internet, but also compromises the right to information of people accessing the service. So here we see that the global nature of the internet represents an indispensable autonomous consideration in the court's reasoning, which is subsequently linked to both the possible technical effects to the network and the disproportionate limitations to the right to freedom of expression. Now, having found the court that the right to privacy of the applicant had indeed been violated, it searched for an alternative uh, remedy in order to offer a balanced protection of both privacy and freedom of expression. Even more striking is the approach of the European Court of Human Rights in a series of cases, including the SATA Media versus Finland case. The applicants, two media companies, complained of a violation of the right to publish in an accessible and searchable form tax data which were already available to the public. In a rather disappointing judgment, the European Court of Human Rights followed a very strict application of data protection law and narrow interpretation of journalistic uh, activity. Judge Sotoria, in her dissenting opinion, was to the point in highlighting that the court essentially shifted the balance from the applicant's freedom of expression case to the protection of the privacy of taxpayers concerned. One would have reasonably expected that the European court would acknowledge the importance of modern pronouncements of freedom of expression online. Now, I had a, also a very interesting example about uh, uh, encryption, but unfortunately, I don't have the time to go through it. Uh, to conclude, there is no doubt that the judge is tasked and burdened with certain difficult exercises, and criticism from the outside may be easier. That said, we need to seriously rethink the relationship of privacy, cybersecurity, and freedom of expression online, and their symbiotic interrelation. Uh, finally, a last point to be underlined is not to lose track of the contributions of national courts. They have proven that they may have a very good grasp of the digital environment and they may come up with very interesting and creative suggestions on the international level. Thank you for your attention and I will be happy to, to answer any questions or follow up with other cases later on. Thank you, Mandela. Thank you.
So the next speaker is uh, Irena Nesterova. Uh, Irena is a lawyer and a lecturer at the University of Latvia, and she's going to speak on the crisis of privacy and sacrifice of personal data in the name of national security, the Court of Justice rulings strengthening EU data protection standards. Irene. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be with you this morning, and I am very grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak today about the right to privacy and data protection in the context of digital mass surveillance through the lens of the Court of Justice of the European Union. The data protection rules nowadays are not only an important economic development tool, but also they are used for national security objectives. A few months ago, as we know, uh, the European Union has made a significant step by adapting the new data protection reform package, which includes the general data protection directive regulation as well the Data Protection regulation, uh, Directive for Police and Criminal Justice Authorities. And the la last aims uh, to improve cooperation in the fight against terrorism. The growing the security threats has uh, also led uh, to introduction of uh, mass surveillance practices, both in Europe and across the Atlantic. The necessity to fight against terrorism has led to introduction of, the, uh, of uh, data retention directive in 2006, requiring member states to oblige telecommunication and internet uh, service providers to retain traffic and location data regarding fixed and mobile telephony, internet access, email communication, and to make it available to law enforcement authorities uh, to prevent and detect serious crime and terrorism. However, the directive was invalidated by the Court of Justice. Retention of uh, communication data as a means uh, of fighting terrorism has been widely applied uh, across the Atlantic following the 9-11 terrorist, uh, ter terrorist attacks. The disclosures made by Edward Snowden in 2013 revealed the mass surveillance of global telecommunication and data flows on a previously unimaginable scale. And these revelations of the extraterritorial and digital mass surveillance undermined trust in the transatlantic relationship and re, uh, raised questions about the lawfulness of the long-term agreements on data transfer between the United States and uh, the European Union, although they are intended purely for commercial purposes. As a general principle, the transfer of personal data may take place only in case um, if third country ensures an adequate level of protection. That turned at the heart of the Schrems case. Now, let, let me briefly summarize the, the essence of uh, two landmark judgments and then continue with the uh, evaluation of the court's position on the justification of interference with the right to privacy and last to evaluate the implications of these judgments. Starting with Digital Rights Ireland case. In this case, uh, Ireland and Austrian courts submitted the references for a preliminary ruling to the Court of Justice asking to evaluate whether the validity of the data retention directive, um, uh, whether it's valid as they had to decide on national measures concerning the retention of communication data. The court annulled the the court annulled uh, the directive fi uh, finding for a number of reasons um, that um, the interference with the fundamental rights goes beyond what is strictly necessary uh, for the protection of national security, and thus it doesn't comply with the principle of pro proportionality. The second Schrems case was brought before the Court of Justice uh, by Court of Ireland, which wanted to know to what extent national authorities are bound by the safe harbor decision forming legal basis uh, for transatlantic data transfers, and whether it allows them to forbid Facebook to transfer fair personal data uh, to servers in the United States. The Court found that national authorities 
help powers to check with complete independence whether a transfer of data from its own member state to a third country complies um, with the requirements laid down by the Data Protection Directive. The Court of Justice further uh, held that the Commission didn't find in the Safe Harbor decision that the United States in fact ensures uh, an adequate level of protection uh, to prevent unlimited access uh, of personal data uh, by the um, uh, United States public un uh, authorities. Therefore, it invalidated the safe harbor decision. Under further examination of the court's position on the justification of interference with the right to privacy and data protection, we can see that the court in, in both cases has stressed that such an interference requires a strict proportionality and necess necessity test. However, it has not taken a clear stand um, regarding the requirement to respect the very essence of uh, the right to privacy that would cancel the further application of proportionality test. In the Digital Rights Ireland case, the court found that mass metadata surveillance, unlike the content of communication, does not affect the essence of the right to privacy. And subsequently, in the Schrems case, it found that uh, access on a generalized basis to the content of, co of communications data by pu public authorities compromises the essence of uh, the right to privacy. And uh, such a differentiation nowadays uh, no longer seems to be justified. The way society now communicates has rapidly changed, increasingly preferring use of portable devices such as smartphones and tablets and um, uh, that cover all of our communication, calls, emails, web searches, and these changes have made uh, metadata surveillance unique and valuable tool both for law enforcement authorities and uh, for uh, commercial purposes, as it may provide very precise information on the every communication and movement of the person. At the same time, of course, the Court of Justice uh, in both cases has emphasized that the necessity and proportionality principle requires to set differentiation, exception, limitation with regard to persons, means of communication and data concerns, as well to set limits uh, of the access of the national authorities to the data. The court also stresses the need to apply strong procedural safeguards, such as independent oversight mechanism and effective remedies. However, it has to be acknowledged that despite these guarantees, mass surveillance still stays an unresolved problem. Even with procedural guarantees, massive and indiscriminate surveillance of individuals for the purpose of national security cannot be considered justified. The two able mentioned judgments have raised serious implications, both at national and EU level. Both judgments call for a common political agreement on the scope of state surveillance. On the national level, the Digital Rights Ireland judgment has caused different responses among member states. Bringing a case before national courts has proved to be the most effective way uh, to have national data retention laws reviewed. Uh, there is also a new pending case because uh, before the Court of Justice Tele 2 Sverige that concerns Digital Rights Ireland case and national regimes governing retention of electronic communication data. There have also been different legislative responses among member states, but mostly they have been slow to review the national laws to comply with the requirements set by the court. The Schrems case um, also has sig significantly strengthened the role of data protection authorities by empowering them to examine the level of data protection in third countries to comply with the individual claims. However, there could be diver different views among different states on the level of um, protection in these countries, and judgment uh, could lead to legal uncertainty as different standards of protection could be applied throughout the Europe. Both judgments thus call for a common political agreement on state surveillance issues, which have dual nature. First, state surveillance has to be uh, viewed in, uh, as a, it, it is a question of national security, but it, it is, uh, has to be viewed also uh, from in the context of protection of personal data as human rights. Uh, 
And from this point of view, it is also evaluated by the Court of Justice. However, it's primarily a duty of national parliaments to deal with surveillance issues, to review their laws, uh, taking into account both aspects without waiting for the court decisions and to reach a political agreement on the scope of state surveillance. Last, turning to the implications uh, on the EU level, the standards set in both cases are applicable to any existing or planned EU legislation involving large-scale collection and processing of personal data. The highly controversial policy response to the terrorist attacks is a passenger name record directive. Uh, which was adopted uh, on this April, and uh, the question arises whether uh, the data retention mechanisms, in particular uh, the new directive as well, agreements, um, passenger name record agreements with third countries comply with the requirements set by the court. And the court uh, will soon provide opinion in uh, the case A115 on the validity of the passenger name record uh, agreement between the European Union and Canada. Uh, that will have major impact on other agreements as well on new directive. Deep concerns have been expressed whether these measures comply with privacy, in particular taken uh, that a link between the data retained and a threat to public, uh, uh, public uh, security cannot be established if the data is retained in a bulk. And uh, the Court of Justice is el also to, uh, expected to clarify such a complicated questions whether, uh, whether um, uh, differentiation of data can be um, possible due to the fact that there is anonymity. The Schrems case, is rises, uh, case raises further questions of protection of mass uh, surveillance of EU citizens' data carried out by the United States. In the result of Schrems' case two months ago, the Commission has adopted the new Privacy Shield. This rapidly adopted framework for data transfer has also to be viewed, has, has also been widely criticized, arguing that also it introduces new procedural safeguards. It won't be able to provide effective uh, protection against surveillance, and its validity will most probably be repeatedly challenged before the Court of Justice. It has to be acknowledged that the EU data protection law by itself cannot provide effective protection of personal data, and transatlantic dialogue is needed on the appropriate limits of surveillance. And there is a need to maintain a common political agreement on the scope of state surveillance that can be clearly seen for both judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union. The growing economic, uh, economic importance of data processing and emergence of big data on the one hand and growing security needs on the other have brought deep challenges over the effective protection of fundamental rights within the Europe and um, uh, as well all over the world. And uh, require, that requires new approaches and solutions and such global initiatives as development of new international norms regarding surveillance and international privacy standards could bring the great benefit of setting appropriate limits to mass digital surveillance and to establish a commonly agreed balance between privacy and national security. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to speak today with you and uh, I wish you a very good conference. Thank you, Ren. Okay, the last speaker is Dr. Kubo Machak. Uh, Kubo is lecturer at the University of Exeter, and he is going to speak on Power Vacuum 2.0 is the international law of cybersecurity in crisis. Kubo. Thank you, Nicholas, for your kind introduction. Uh, Hello, everyone. I, I guess I should start with an apology uh, for the wrong date on my title slide. Uh, as it happens, tomorrow I'm going to be the best man at my best friend's wedding on the 10th of September, so I can promise you I'm not going to use the same slides. 
but the date must have been on my mind when I was finalizing them. And so I see that also time is quite advanced, so I thought in the interest of saving some at the end for discussion, I'm going to make a couple of quicker moves through my argument. So if anything is unclear, I will be very happy to clarify or share the paper indeed with anyone who is interested. So is international law of cybersecurity in crisis is a question kind of of the kind, is this glass half empty or is it half full? You know, so it depends. Do you see yourself as an optimist or do you see yourself as a pessimist? And so today I'm going to present the optimist's take of the current situation and I'm going to argue that we should view the situation as a prime opportunity for states to reclaim their central role in international lawmaking. And so we may debate as many do, the, the extent to which we are observing a decline of the sovereign state, but the fact remains that any analysis of international lawmaking, uh, interpretation and application must start and finish with states. And so I'm going to do the same uh, in this presentation. And I would argue that the same uh, approach must apply to cyberspace as well. So given the specialization of this panel, I think I don't need to remind this audience that cyberspace is a borderless space, uh, the uses and abuses of which impinge on vital state interests, which may range from national security, economic development, public safety, and so on. So by definition, it extends beyond the domain of internal affairs. And because of that, we need to understand how international law applies to cyberspace. Now, unfortunately, for a long period of time, the reaction of states could be best described by the metaphor of a sleepwalker. So if you think about sleepwalking, you know, you start with these dreamlike fantasies. They might be taking a little bit too long. You might be moving, but who knows if you're moving in the right direction. And probably at any given time, the best idea is just to wake up. And so I, I would argue that the same can be applied to the initial reaction of the states. There are these, fant these early fantasies of cyberspace being a terra nullius, a sovereignty-free zone. And it took a very long time for states to react to this. And actually, it was until 2013 when in a consensus report of a panel of uh, governmental experts at the United Nations, it was held that international law indeed applies to cyberspace. So finally now it seems that we are starting to have an emerging consensus in the international community that international law applies. But the question then becomes, do we actually know how it applies to cyberspace? And if we don't know that, does that mean that we are in a situation of crisis? So there are certainly some indicators of this crisis. First of all, area of cybersecurity appears quite resistant to codification. But this is not for the want of trying. Already in 1996, France came with the proposal of a charter for international cooperation on the internet. And then in 2011, and again in 2015, China and Russia came with a proposal of the code of conduct for, international security, for information security. But there has been very little enthusiasm from other states, and it seems that it's quite unlikely that we will see a comprehensive multilateral binding treaty anytime soon. Now turning to the second main source of international law, customer international law, of the two components of custom, both are quite problematic in the area of cybersecurity. So if you think about state practice, by definition, cyber operations are covert and very difficult to identify. So state practice is inevitably shrouded in secrecy. But even if we know what the states are doing, turning to the second element of custom, opinio iuris, any statements, any proclamations by states have been few and far between and quite unspecific in this area. So this amounts overall to the state's reluctance to develop cyber custom. But thirdly, that does not mean that states have entirely resigned on cyber governance, but instead of developing and interpreting rules, I argue, they have sought refuge in the vacuous language of norms. And so overall what we see is a normative activity outside of traditional international law. Now certainly I'm not claiming that this is specific to cyber, and in fact uh, international legal theorists, I think we have Professor Jean d'Aspremont among us, have described this uh, in their writings uh, as, and this is uh, Professor d'Aspremont's term, as the pluralization of international norm making. So certainly this exists as a general trend, but then the question becomes for us, what impact do these factors have on actual cyber governance? So in the next step, it's not true that we would not have any rules, that there would be no existing legal landscape applying to cybersecurity. 
Firstly, we have existing generally applicable rules. And so you may apply the logic of the nuclear weapons advisory opinion in which the ICJ held that the, the general provisions on the use of force found in the UN Charter apply to any use of force, regardless of the weapons used. And so I argue that the same applies to the area of cybersecurity. But the problem with these generally applicable rules is that they are far too general for our benefit. So then secondly, we have what has been described in the literature as a patchwork of regulations. So sectoral and regional treaties. But the problem with those, some of which you can see on the slide, the problem with those treaties is that they are either too narrow. So think about the constitution of the International Telecommunications Union. Yes, it covers a narrow slice of operations that might have relevance for cybersecurity, such as those operations that interfere with telecommunications networks. But they are all too narrow in their coverage. Or, if they, are, uh, if they attempt to be comprehensive, such as the regional uh, treaties, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organizations Treaty or the African Union Cybersecurity Convention, the problem is that their membership is extremely limited. So the Shanghai Cooperation Organizations Treaty has six members and very small prospects of growing significantly further, and the African Union's convention, I checked this morning, has still zero ratifications. So, because of that, in the third step, we see an absence of a complex regulatory mechanism. And because states are reluctant to contribute by their norm-making activity to the creation of such a complex mechanism, what we have observed is the emergence of a power vacuum. And so one of those steps that I'm going to uh, move through slightly quicker is the relationship between power and law in which I would compare the law of outer space with the law of cybersecurity. But I'm going to move to what this has resulted in. So when states move away from their norm-making activities in this area, uh, the power vacuum that is created is then moved into by other actors. And so what we have seen is the emergence of non-state-driven norm-making initiatives. And so I'd like to briefly introduce two of such initiatives today. Now, the first one, Microsoft's International Cybersecurity Norms Proposal, originates from 2014. And then the second one is NATO's uh, Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, which is based in Tallinn, so eponymous Tallinn Manual Project from 2013 that is now undergoing a revision. So, Obviously, if you are online at the moment, as you should be, you can look up both of those because they are publicly available, and I'm not going to go into detail on any of those. And if you're not on, you know, shopping on Amazon, as you should not be, you can then see the details of those proposals. But I'm just going to highlight some key differences. So firstly, the Microsoft's proposal is obviously an industry-led process, whereas Tallinn Manual is an academic-led process, notably presided by Professor Mike Schmidt. And then they differ also in their declared aims. So whereas Microsoft tries to push for the prevention of exploitation of cyberspace by states for, uh, for their military purposes, and they say it very expressly, Tallinn Manual's uh, uh, approach or aim is rather to replicate customer international law applicable to cyber operations and by this way assist the states in understanding what international law obligations they might have. They also differ in the breadth that they cover. So whereas uh, Microsoft's proposal proposes quite broad norms that are limited in their number, uh, the Tallinn menu is uh, uh, greater in number, so we have 95, but quite specific rules. So yes, there are these differences, but for the purposes of my argument, it is what these initiatives share that is crucial. And so they both are expressly non-binding. It is made clear in both of these proposals. It is also not disputed that they have an obviously non-state origin, but, and this is crucial, they are state-oriented. In other wo words, what they do is they propose a normative framework which should be observed by states in relation to their cyber activities. So you might ask, what is then the relevance of these expressly non-binding initiatives from the perspective of international law. And my argument is that, yes, their normativity in the sense of the strength of their claim to authority, right? So the normativity of such initiatives is obviously lower than that of international law rules. However, they are not without relevance for international law. Firstly, they may constitute an intermediate stage towards a more rigorously binding system of legal rules. Then secondly, they may, by their inclusion of these non-state actors in the process, 
they may increase the inclusivity of the norm-making process on the international plane. And then thirdly, and of course, their eventual destiny will depend on the reaction of states. So in a sense, we are now at a critical juncture, and what matters is whether states will lift the gauntlet, if you will, that is thrown at them by these non-state actors. Now, in my research, and again, I'm going to uh, go quite quickly through this move, I analyzed certain historical parallels that we find in other domains, such as the law of Antarctica, the law of nuclear safety, where we have also seen the emergence of non-binding norms that were then consolidated into complex binding instruments. What I argue today is that we are starting to observe signs of convergence in the area of cybersecurity among the various initiatives that concern cyberspace. And so then this prepares the ground for the final move of this argument, which is that all in all, it amounts to a moderately optimistic picture. So the glass is half full indeed. Firstly, what this means is that in the absence of state-led lawmaking, non-state initiatives should be seen not as signs of crisis, but rather as opportunities for states to identify overlaps uh, between these initiatives and their own strategic and political objectives. Secondly, it is the right time. Yeah, for, so I, I argue that the advances that have been made in relation to the attribution problem show that the time is ripe now for states to endorse the regulatory and deterrent potential for international law rules. And then finally, on this basis, in the third move, as I promised I would start and end with states, states should reclaim their central role, and I argue that they should do that in three steps, going from the immediate term to medium to long term. So in the most immediate term, states should become more forthcoming in expressing their cyber opinion juris, which will then enable us to consolidate the cyber custom in this area. In the more medium term, states should overcome their current aversion that they have to cyber treaty commitments, and we are seeing some bilateral developments in that area already. And then thirdly, in the long term, and this is the optimist in me, perhaps this will then build the trajectory towards an agreement on a comprehensive multilateral undertaking on cybersecurity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kubo. Uh, now the, the floor is open to questions. I know we started a bit um, later than we were supposed to. So I suggest we take kind of five, ten minutes from the lunch break uh, to have a discussion. Um, I hope no one faints, um, but um, I propose as well to take a group of uh, round of three questions and uh, please uh, introduce yourselves and be very concise um, and short in your questions so you can allow other people to ask questions as well and I hope the speakers will be very concise in their responses. So um, we can start with uh, second row here, the first question, and then on the sixth and the eighth row. Okay, Martin Shainen is my name, and my question is really about the uh, ICCPR, Article 17 provision on the right to privacy, and the question whether an additional protocol is a good idea. And my answer is no, but I'm still asking you the question. And I think, in general, substantive protocols to human rights treaties have proven a failure. Because only some states ratify, and then it creates an a contrario uh, argument that as there was an additional protocol, it cannot be covered by the ori original treaty. We have that uh, uh, with Protocol 12 of the European Convention broadly speaking, with the protocols to the European Convention. So um, procedural additional protocols work, but uh, substantive don't. Only one that has proven useful is Protocol 1 to the European Convention, because it was drafted already in the very beginning. So I think uh, there are better ideas, such as a Human Rights Committee general comment on Article 17, but no new tr treaty, which would be destructive. I, suggest, but this is a question. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, the lady on the fifth row and then on the seventh. Uh, my name is Kirsten Sellers. Um, I'm from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And um, in response to the final speaker, 
um, we've seen a very tangible manifestation of uh, China's approach to, to, to cyberspace, which is uh, a, a, a link between cyberspace and sovereignty, and territory being used, the territorial principle being used as a basis for that claim. And so when I flew here to Paris, we cannot log on to the internet on the aircraft while we are in Chinese airspace. Um, so already you can see uh, the consolidation of some very important areas of state practice. I wanted to ask a question, though, of uh, our, our Professor Christakis. Um, and your very positive appraisal of um, the existence of privacy, and you challenged this idea of the death of privacy and uh, took issue with Mark Zuckerberg saying privacy is over. But I wonder whether privacy is, in fact, quite historically specific. Uh, the ICCPR was negotiated in the 1950s where you had a coincidence of two very important things. One, the ability to exercise privacy. Two, an idea that state regulation should be repudiated. And we do not have quite that same sentiment today. I mean, a lot of the commentary on the internet, for example, talks about our collusion with the absence of privacy. We know the internet isn't free, uh, it, but instead of playing for ca paying cash, we pay with data. And I wonder if actually Zuckerberg, for better or worse, is actually right. Thank you. Hello, I'm Christian Jeffal from the Humboldt Institute of Internet and Society. Thank you very much for those um, three very interest, uh, four very interesting um, presentations. And I have three uh, very quick questions. My first one goes uh, to Dr. Um, Kachar, if I uh, pronounce it uh, correctly. Um, you had a very interesting metaphor at the um, beginning, um, the positivist um, saying the glass is half full. Um, empty, and I would suggest that the realist would just drink the water. Um, and uh, this I say in relation to your methodology, because you really um, developed it out of uh, history of um, uh, international law regulation for the internet. And I wonder what the actual problems on the ground of cybersecurity play, um, uh, what role they play in your research methodology. Um, a similar question, very quick, to uh, Professor um, Karistakis. Um, to what extent, um, uh, as you said, IoT should be regulated? To what extent would you consider IoT a technology, since it's based on different technologies that have been around for quite a while, like RFID, the Internet, wearable computings, uh, computing? This is all um, actually technologies from the 90s. So. What do you think, um, how can we um, um, regulate IoT, which has also this actor, um, actor um, um, dimension, which I think is much, um, much more um, concerning than just the, just the sensor part. And now I'm gonna be really brief um, to the uh, second uh, speaker, very quick. Um, do you also have a, concept of IT security as opposed to cyber security. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So more than three questions, but Theodore, do you want to? Thank you very much. Well, the three questions were observations, as a matter of fact, very, very useful for the debate. First, about uh, the uh, debate concerning an additional protocol. Um, the real problem, of course, I perfectly uh, understand what you're saying. The real problem is always the same. Um, how are we going to adapt all treaties to new realities, which are um, especially in the field of uh, technological innovation, um, extremely uh, important? Uh, uh, there are two ways to do this. Either, uh, if we talk about Article 17, um, you said, well, a general comment might be more useful, which means uh, evolutive interpretation. We all know how it works with Article 8, with uh, uh, the ICPR also, and probably uh, FAPAS RGs. I don't know if there are other members of the Human Rights uh, Committee. 
could give us some feedback about their will to adopt a modernized uh, general command concerning Article 17 in order to try to catch up with reality. Um, the problem is that evolutive interpretation has uh, some limits. I mean, uh, from a certain point of view, uh, we cannot uh, just uh, hope, uh, yesterday there was a paper about uh, uh, consensual interpretation, use of consensus uh, in the interpretation of the European Convention of Human Rights. If we just wait for consensus to ar arise about IoT, uh, goodbye. Uh, uh, we can say goodbye to privacy and uh, to, to all these things. So the other solution is to try to adopt new treaties. I, uh, uh, I do share um, uh, some of your uh, reluctance concerning an additional protocol. But I have no doubt about the fact that we need hard positive law on those issues. Uh, the real thing that will happen, as I said before, I was not able to discuss it in my paper, is that we see a universalization of European standards. It's not the first time. Uh, the whole human rights process was this, uh, as a matter of fact. And I think that this is what will happen. There are today uh, 111 data protection uh, national uh, laws, domestic laws, and if you study them extensively, you will see that they already incorporate about 70 percent of the EU 95 uh, protection, uh, data protection uh, directive, which means that through, in one way or another we will go towards, I hope we do, because I'm a, a, a very big champion of privacy, uh, we will go towards a universalization of these standards if we don't give up the fight. Uh, uh, the, uh, what is the best instrument to do this? This is something to debate. This answers in part the second question, uh, which is, um, uh, was Zuckerberg right? And uh, uh, of course, Zuckerberg, it's his, uh, his business, isn't it, to use your data? And all uh, my good colleagues who are on Facebook and publish uh, every photo of their children and uh, uh, all these things, this is very good for Zuckerberg. It's very good also for uh, Tim Cook, who said that when, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, you have to realize that when you use an online service, um, uh, a free online service, you're not a customer, you are the product. Uh, uh, I do not share at all this uh, opinion. I think that privacy matters, and not only for me. We have studies which clearly show, as a matter of fact, that people care about their privacy. The whole um, also reaction to the national security surveillance uh, um, issue is a very good proof of that. We just need to uh, explain to people that they can protect privacy and adopt privacy-friendly policies. Now, a whole discussion could be extremely interesting about, you said that privacy could be a historically specific issue. Uh, I don't think so. I personally think that, of course, we can say that the ICPR uh, or the Article 8 of the European Convention were adopted as a reaction uh, to um, uh, states like a uh, 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 reaction to Nazism or to uh, the Soviet Union, etc. Uh, uh, it was historically specific from this point of view, but as a matter of fact, we could, there is a very good book about the history of privacy by uh, uh, Vincent, uh, 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 a colleague in the UK, and uh, I, I think that uh, it's something that's extremely valuable for the digital era. Uh, last question. Uh, I don't think, uh, as a matter of fact, of course, there is a continuity in the technological uh, field. I do think that the IoT are entirely new. Uh, we do use, of course, uh, all technologies concerning sensors, but the idea of connected objects and uh, the whole big data, I don't think that the IoT, uh, uh, when I'm talking about that, I'm not limiting my uh, analysis to hardware. Uh, or to sensors. I think that the whole revolution about the IoT is the connectivity and uh, the use of data analytics and data science in order and algorithms in order to generate automatically solutions. And I think that this is something entirely new and will entirely transform our world and we need precisely legal responses. Thank you. Um, Mando, do you want to... Uh, very quickly, I would probably include IT security in cybersecurity. Uh, as far as the, the, the question on uh, the feasibility and desirability of the, an additional protocol to Article 17 of the ICPR, the Special Rapporteur, the, the recently appointed Special Rapporteur on Privacy, has called for a Geneva Convention uh, on privacy issues. Uh, one of the thorny 
questions is uh, that will not be resolved anyway with uh, an additional protocol is the, the issue of uh, the fact that the US uh, objects to the extraterritorial applicability of Article 17 of the ICPR. Uh, I think, uh, personally, I'm not in favor of an additional protocol. I don't think it's feasible uh, anyway. Um, and yes, an evolutionary interpretation, possibly a general comment would be interesting. But the main focus, and I think the reason that many people, they're trying to, to stress the possibility of an additional protocol to the uh, ICPR, is to retain the issue of privacy as an international issue and not as a domestic issue. Uh, right now, there's a strong trend, especially coming uh, from the US, China, Russia, and possibly other states as well, to treat privacy as a domestic issue only. Uh, and there is uh, a struggle there. So in this sense, it's useful, the narrative. I think we have a mic here. <clears throat> okay, so, so thank you very much for both questions. Very interesting. Uh, so firstly, about China, uh, I guess I can answer that in two parts. Firstly, thank you very much for referring to this example because I think it's it's very useful to, to have that on the table as well. Uh, secondly, I don't disagree. Uh, actually, what um, now we have a, a, an ongoing project with uh, Wuhan University uh, where we are looking at differences between the rule of law approaches to the regulation in cyberspace between, you know, you could say China and the rest versus US and the West, yeah, kind of two camps. And so uh, one of the things that's emerging is that from, from, from this research is that the differences might be becoming smaller than they uh, were seen originally. So, uh, you know, it's becoming something of a cliche to say that China is the key proponent of cyber sovereignty, but uh, there are some, uh, to, to the extent that we have these limited proclamations coming from Western states, so just recently the US issued a, a Joint Operations 2035 document by the Joint Forces uh, in which a very prominent space is given precisely to uh, sovereignty in cyberspace. So we might be seeing the two camps coming closer together there. So that's uh, that's the first one. Then uh, secondly, uh, the question as I understood it was, uh, we have new challenges in cyberspace, so how does that affect research methodology? Is that it? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I can uh, I can quote uh, Gennady Danilenko back at you, uh, who already 30 years ago uh, said that uh, in order for the international legal system to remain effective, it needs to engage in lawmaking in novel so far ungoverned areas, here we have, yeah, cyberspace, and constant upgrading and refinement of the existing law. So uh, my question in, in this paper is, is international law effective or are we observing a crisis here? Now I don't think for that we need a new methodology, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So we can use the traditional international law methodology looking at do we have these sources of international law, can we ascertain them using the methodology that is very well known to us, or are states re remaining silent or at least not acting in legally meaningful ways and if they are doing that, what are the reasons for that? So I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel but I acknowledge that some of the challenges in this area are novel. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I suggest we take another round of three questions. Um, it's Faye and one, uh, yes, uh, uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's uh, the lady. Okay. Yeah. Work? Take the floor. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, Fotini Pizartis from the University of Athens. Um, I will express my own views, uh, Theodore. Thank you for, or not, thank, do, I do not thank you for calling on me. Uh, but I would just like to add my agreement to what was said before by um, Martin Scheinin. Uh, I think that it would probably be hard to um, see uh, an adoption of an optional protocol to the ICCPR at this stage. Of course, that has to do with uh, the views of states' parties, so in any case. Um, but I think it would be hard. And the se my second point is to remind you that, of course, through general comments, the committee, and the committee already has uh, general comment uh, 1988 um, uh, explaining um, its position on the right to, to privacy. So there was already uh, an interpretation. Uh, it might be old, it might be time to review it, but at this point, at least to my knowledge, um, there is no specific uh, proposal to, to receive this comment. As you know, the committee is now um, re-looking over the, the, the right to life. 
So that will take some time. But I think, I mean, we, we do have the general comment. Of course it was in 1988. And of course, uh, it, it, some issues regarding the cyber, cyber ideas are contained in the comment. And I just would like to draw the attention of people uh, hearing what you had to say and thanking all the speakers who have addressed this issue. That, um, I mean, that there is a constant interpretation going on um, within various bodies. It doesn't only have to be the ICCPR. I mean, we have heard from all the speakers what is going on in different fora as well as to how to address these issues. So, I mean, there is some form of practice, as you say, I don't know what the opinion of yours is yet, but there is some form of practice going uh, along moving forwards in many, uh, in many, many fora, not only on the international level of the, the covenants. So um, that would, it would just remain to, to be seen what, what would happen. And of course, what is going on within, uh, I mean, the, by the rapporteurs in the United Nations and other places. But we do need to keep in mind, we do have a, uh, one interpretation and there, there is ongoing dialogue between, with the states, um, if not much case law at this point, but on, uh, dialogue and things being, the issues of uh, protection and all this are being brought up with, with states uh, involved during dialogues. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think there's a final. Uh, yes, good morning. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. I'm Adriana Bonomo from the Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, I must admit I'm not an expert in this specific law field, but uh, I was really interested into the topic. And my question would be to Kubo, actually. Um, because I, I was considering, uh, you referred to the opportunity of developing an international multilateral instrument on cyberspace and cybersecurity. And of course, I do share the same optimistic approach. However, if I think about an international treaty or instrument, I think, about, I think globally, and I, I must consider that there are many, many countries in the world which either do not have access or do not have the IT capacity or know-how to access the cyberspace present. And I was wondering, um, are there constraints to the development of an effective international instrument representing all interests and all needs of all states, considering that there are states which have limited even technical capacities to implement such a treaty. And in this sense, I believe that it's indicative that the African Union Convention has not been ratified yet, and uh, also the fact that the, the two norm-making laboratories are established in the context of Western, in a Western context, there is NATO and uh, a private corporation. Thank you. All right, uh, excellent question, and I think you know you're spot on. This is this is what we're dealing with here, and that's why it's a long-term goal. So uh, the impediments are there. To what you have said, I would also add that uh, we have this value split. But perhaps, as uh, we have discussed a little bit before, uh, we might be seeing a, bi a bit of convergence between the two camps. But of course, th 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 I'm not being uh, you know an I don't want to be too overly optimistic there. And what is also important and should be mentioned, something, called, uh, something that Peter Singer calls the cybersecurity knowledge gap. So we have a problem that uh, uh, certain people very high up in, in uh, the states around the world are not knowledgeable enough about this area. And to some extent, it might be a generational issue, but uh, you know, we, we need to move past that. And uh, that's, I think, for, for all of us also on an individual basis to attend to. But uh, so the impediments are there, but uh, to kind of maintain the optimistic thread here, there are some areas on which states, I believe, could start finding some consensus. And so the idea is to begin with definitions, because first we need to know what cyber attack is, what uh, critical infrastructure is, and the problem is that we don't have even an agreement on that. But that could already be the subject of uh, a, a kind of multilateral agreement there. And then the next step would be to focus on some common threats. So for example, the emergence of botnets, you know, when you are controlling uh, a series of zombie or a network of zombie computers around the world to attack one particular target, that can be a threat felt by all states. So again, acting against these common th commonly perceived threats can be a way of finding common ground. And uh, in addition to that, we already have some collaboration between states in mitigating cyber incidents, so collaboration of these CERTs, yeah, uh, computer emergency response teams. And so again, that's something that could be built on. So there are 
areas in which we can be more optimistic, but of course we are not going to see this uh, very soon, and that's why I also propose the solution in these three steps. But thank you for the question. Thank you, Kubo. So with this we conclude. If you have any questions, of course, you can continue during the breaks or tomorrow. Uh, I just want to thank our speakers for their uh, great contributions. Thank you.